All right, so here we are with the unintentional part two. I don't know what happened there. I was sure I pressed pause, but I guess it got stopped. Anyways, we were getting up to th almost 30 minutes there anyways, so um, I'll put them together on a playlist. Okay, so yes, I, I looked it up on Scalemates, and it, the, uh, the tooling for this kit was... Uh, in, uh, done in 1975 and new parts were produced from those tools in 2003 I guess from until 75 to 2003 uh, they were the original parts that were produced I don't know anyways and then in a new box um, in 2007 with the current box All right, so I, I might be repeating myself again. If I am, I'll, I'll, I'll delete this in post-production. But uh, I was looking at the analytics and, you know, you know a lot of my, most of my viewers are, are older men guys my age, maybe a little younger, maybe a little older, whatever the case may be. So, and, and, and those seem to be the ones who most enjoy this hobby. Although there's a lot of younger guys out there. Um, you know, Matt at Model Middens and uh, plenty of others. So, uh, but yeah, for, uh, for your older, for your older fellas, uh, like me, if you have grandchildren, uh, and, and uh, you may have already tried to encourage some of them to, uh, get into this hobby. Um, but anyways, if, if, if you do want to, uh, start getting them interested in it and, um, you can watch my videos together. Don't get me wrong. I'm not begging for viewers. I'm not begging for subscribers. I'm just saying my channel is perfect for, uh, a, a young person or any novice who, um, is interested in, in getting into the hobby. So. Um, so yeah, everybody's always welcome. Men, women, young people, everybody. And so in the box here, in a bunch of languages, we get some different things. Um, oh, and of course, um, you, know, young, you know, younger people getting into the, uh, just starting out in the hobby, they should start with some adult supervision. And uh, they, they should be taught um, how to safely use the, the sharp things that we use in this hobby and um, you know just basic stuff uh, quite a ways back uh, as part of the model railroad project I did a I did a video on safety and uh, all that kind of stuff so I might produce something again along those lines you know, thing, you know, the basic knife skills and the nippers and the snippers and all that kind of stuff. So, anyways, enough of that. Okay, so uh, we've got the we've got a nice booklet here. Uh, same photograph of the uh, the completed models. And at the bottom here, uh, you see this at the top. It looks like the coke cage pieces are opened up. And then here, at the bottom, uh, there there may be two ways to do it. I don't know. I didn't see anything in the parts that looked like this, uh, or in the photo edge. So we'll just try and figure that out. It's in Japanese here. So okay. And then for the history buffs, and uh, they uh, they do a really nice. You know, a lot of this is in Japanese, but they do a really nice job of of the uh, Armor Reconnaissance Bal uh, Battalion, Order of Battle, um, all the dates and uh, uh, different uh, different service um, areas. Uh, here they've got Battalion HQ, Battalion HQ Signal, and that's uh, for the Armor Reconnaissance Bal Battalion 41. And then they've got information on armaments. Down here, the, um, uh, the 
the markings. So yeah, that's very nice. And then they've got more details down here on the Armored Reconnaissance Battalion. And then we get quite a detailed write-up on uh, service history and, and so forth. So I, I won't read it all. Um, but a bit of background. And so um, the post-World War I Versailles Treaty severely limited the number and type of military vehicles Germany was permitted to possess. No tanks of any kind were allowed and only a small number of older armored cars could be used for border patrol and police work. Starting in 1920, the SD KFZZ-3 armored personnel carrier served with police and military units, but possessed poor cross-country performance due to its solid rubber tires. In the late 1920s, the Armaments Ministry called for a new armored carrier that could meet a series of demanding requirements. However, development was brought to a premature end by the worldwide financial collapse of 1929. These budgetary and excuse me, these budgetary and treaty imposed limitations led to Germany's development of simulating fighting, simulated fighting vehicles for use in training exercises. The earliest of these paper panzers was simply a dummy tank body mounted on a car chassis. So even back then you know, they were getting ready for the next war. In 1930 came a standardized design for a mock armored car, which featured an aluminum or thin steel body on an Adler Standard 6 car chassis. The use of such dummy vehicles helped the German army develop doctrines of mechanization and armored warfare during the interwar period. These ideas would gain even more momentum with the rearmament begun in earnest under Adolf Hitler. So uh, one of the biggest problems of, of the early vehicles, uh, the tanks, uh, vehicles like this and so on and so forth, was simply engines weren't powerful enough, um, you, you know, to make a heavily armored vehicle uh, feasible. <coughs> so, uh, you know, what they did here was kind of brilliant in that, okay, well, you know, we can't make real ones, so uh, we'll make pretend ones and we'll practice on those. So that when we can make real ones, we know what to do with them. So early in the war, um, these these were used as reconnaissance vehicles, and you know also as you know, assault vehicles as well, um, but mostly for reconnaissance uh, because they, they were fast, they were fairly light, uh, they were well armed. Um, uh, the, the main armament was a 20 millimeter gun, uh, cannon, auto cannon, and then uh, MG 34 machine gun. This one, the SDKFZ Z222, uh, replaced the 221, and uh, the crew was increased from uh, 2 to 3. Uh, and then they were equipped with wireless uh, radio uh, as well. So that was pretty much pretty essential when you were a reconnaissance unit, because you might be far out ahead. And it made things a heck of a lot easier just to be able to radio back. Uh, but that's the other reason that they uh, deployed them with motorcycles, was that before uh, they had uh, radios, and if they were out of range for visual signals, the, uh, you know, they could do their reconnaissance and send the motorcycle back at speed um, uh, to report what the reconnaissance had, had found. Uh, by 1943, though, they were kind, they were obsolete. Um, uh, they were too lightly, uh, the armor was too light, 
they were easily taken out by the uh, Allied armaments uh, that were uh, in use by that time. And so uh, they, the, the, uh, uh, the German Africa Corps and the Wehrmacht, they moved more, more to the Hanomags, the, the half-tracks. Uh, they were much heavier, uh, maybe not as fast, but uh, they were good on the, on the same kind of terrain and well-armored and well-armed. So about a thousand models altogether were produced by the end of 1943 and then, as I said, they were gradually phased out. They served in a, a number of, not just in North Africa, but they served in another uh, number of different theaters. Uh, Norway, west coast of France, and even the outskirts of Moscow. So uh, that's it for the history. I'm not going to go through the whole thing again. Um, you know, Wikipedia is out there. There's lots of other resources. Um, so that's that. Uh, and the rest is just in different languages. Got German here, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, and so uh, we get the pretty standard to me instructions. Uh, we've got the got the guy here saying read before assembly. And that's, that's the first thing before starting any kit. You go through the instructions right from beginning to end. Uh, that way you can identify anything that doesn't make sense to you or uh, whatever the case may be so you can figure it out. Uh, the other thing I do, especially with these older kits, um, is, uh, but it's a good idea for, for all of them, which I do almost always, uh, is to... Uh, Give them a soak and give the parts a soak in warm water for 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, not hot water, uh, just warm water like you'd wash your hands with, and uh, a bit of dish soap. Uh, leave them soak for 15 or 20 minutes, and then uh, rinse them off and lay them out on paper towel or newspaper uh, to dry off overnight. Uh, that removes any dust or film. Uh, uh, Often uh, there's a, a film placed on the uh, on the molds uh, to make the the plastic come away from them easier once it, once the molding's been done, and so uh, that soak helps get rid of that residue and makes the surface easier to paint and so forth. All right, and so you know then we get the usual caution, and then they they give the details. On, uh, of course, it's Tamiya colors, uh, which colors to use. Shows you here when you see this that that's when you see that in the instructions, that's the, the Tamiya paint number. And then it gives you the basic tools you're going to need uh, cement. Um, most use the, uh, the Tamiya extra thin. I think it's extra thin. Yeah, Tamiya extra thin cement. It's, uh, it dries fast uh, with a good bond. Um, if there's something that you, that you need a, a, a stronger bond or if you're, um, if you're trying to uh, cement a painted surface to painted surface for some reason, you can use a, a thicker cement. Tamiya has a, a thicker one. And there's also Mr. Cement from Mr. Hobby. Sure, there's others out there. Uh, good thing to, it, it, yeah, avoid. I mean, everyone's welcome to do what they want, um, but the, the the cement in a tube uh, isn't. Try to avoid that. Um, some, I, I think, Ravel does one that uh, they have a, a long, thin applicator, uh, which some guys like to use. But uh, the stuff that comes out straight from the tube, uh, you want to avoid that. It, it's and, and you don't want to apply it. If you have to use it, you don't want to apply it directly. What you want to do is you want to squirt it out onto a piece of, a small piece of tin foil. And then 
um, pick it up with either a, a toothpick or you know a bamboo stick or uh, you could even use a brush but you want to make sure you put the brush in a good solvent afterwards otherwise your brush will be wrecked okay so yeah basic tools is the cement the side cutters uh, an exacto knife or some other type modeling knife uh, scissors might be needed and tweezers you might also want to get an uh, emery board, board file and uh, that's handy for for sanding off uh, rough edges you know if there's if there's flash which is you know there's not much here so yeah uh, and you know if, if you are beginning then you'll get to know the stuff you like and, and you'll see stuff on videos that you watch uh, techniques that guys use and and, uh, and and other modelers use and so you know you can help th those things can help you to build build your skills and you can build your quote unquote pantry of, of tools um, so yeah uh, again uh, back in the model railroad days still on the channel uh, I did I did a, a basic tools um, video, uh, you know, all the different tools that can be used and so on and so forth. I didn't get into airbrushes and sophisticated things like that. And if you're interested in 3D printing, this isn't the place for you. Um, it's great, and a lot of people are really interested in it, um, but um, it's not for me. So, anyways. Um, so then, yeah, we go through, we get, uh, you know, step one, the basic, the lower hull assembly. The other great thing about Tamiya is, you know, there's no, no super complicated, really long steps. Everything is, you know, pretty basic stuff. You go from step to step to step here, you know, it shows you the different paints and so forth when to glue, when not to glue, uh, all the different assemblies. I mean, yeah, I mean, this is the assembly for the, the 20 millimeter cannon. So, uh, you know, it's not super complex, but it's not just one or two pieces of stuff. Yeah. And then, uh, so you've got that and Painting the figures, the seats, um, the machine gun, installing that, the turret uh, ring and top, moving here with all the little bits of different accessories and so forth, fenders. Exhaust system, various ancillary parts. Uh, step thirteen is cutting out the photo etch and how to how to do it, what to do with it. And how to apply it here. Again, the final ancillaries. You got a lot of detail here. Um, oh, that's what the string is for. There's like a winch. Okay. That's fine. And then step 15, the assembly of the, the barrels and the gas cans. They, they even give you a pump to go into one of the barrels. Uh, so that's, that's that, uh, 14 steps for the, for the vehicle. One step for the drums and, and, uh, there goes the heart attack head again. Cans. Drums and cans. Step 16 is the uh, assembly of the motorcycle. Step 17, the figures. Painting and assembly. And then we move to the different paint schemes. 
you know, the only the only thing you could kind of, and uh, you know, it, it, to me it does it now, uh, but back then they didn't. Uh, is a color insert. So for the age of this kit, you know, I'm not going to ding them too bad for that. Um, but you know, the Nakajima Kate from the 70s that had beautiful uh, color uh, print. So uh, that was from Mania. They're owned by Hasegawa now. Anyways, yeah, so you get the paint schemes, the decaling, uh, and so on and so forth, the different paint schemes. There's three of them, I think. Yeah, there we go. One, two, three. Information and instructions on how to apply the decals. And parts and numbers and, and uh, aftermarket service and all that kind of stuff. So, very nice, very comprehensive. And so now we get down to the rating. And uh, if, if you look at my channel, um, I, I, I changed the rating system a little bit. I added a point for what I'm going to call the value. And I, I've talked about this before. Uh, value to me, when I'm, when I'm trying to decide or, or looking at, at purchasing a kit, I... I look it up on Scalemates, I look at the instructions, so that gives you an idea of the parts and the assembly and all that kind of stuff. And I try to estimate how much, and I ask myself, how, how, much, how many hours of enjoyment am I going to get out of this? And, you know, if you, you, know, if you want to spend a hundred bucks on something and just slap it together and not paint it, put it on the shelf, I don't know why you would, but then that's fine. Um, you, you've spent a hundred bucks for the two hours it took you to put it together. But, um, you know, if you're going to take your time with the assembly and as I, as I do, uh, enjoy it. There, there's no big rush. Uh, it's not a race. Um, it's about uh, enjoying it and taking the time to do it right. And so, you know, for like this $50 kit, uh, you get two vehicles, three figures. So right off the bat there, even before I look at enjoyment, I, I think that's a, that's, that's a pretty good value. And when it comes down to enjoyment, uh, you know, I find, you know, it's about half and half. Uh, you know, half the time is spent assembling the kit. And the other half is in um, painting and decaling it. So, again, so, you know, $50, two, two vehicles, three figures. Um, and I, I really enjoy painting the figures. I, I, you know, when I first got back into the, the hobby, I, I, was, uh, I was very intimidated by it and worried that my, my old fingers wouldn't be able to do it. Um, but I, I have been doing it, and I've done some 172 figures. Uh, you'll see that from the World War I uh, Mark I tank. Uh, 172 figures, and uh, 148 figures for the aircraft, uh, and, and for the RAF diorama. And, you know, they're not perfect, but I, I, I was, I've actually surprised myself at how good they are. So, and of course, practice makes perfect. So, you know, so you spend $50, uh, you get, you know, three vehicles or two vehicles, three, uh, three figures. Maybe, you know, you take your time, no big rush, don't have to do it in an afternoon. Maybe spend five hours putting it together. And then another maybe two hours, maybe three hours, uh, depending on how you do the painting. A lot of things, you know, if you just wait till the end and, um, and paint it all over, 
and then do the details that way. Uh, it's a little different than if you, you know, do the, do, you know, you paint up the smaller parts um, that are going to go on after. Um, and then, you know, as you paint up the parts individually, as they go together. Uh, however, whatever system works out best for you. So, but again, about 50-50. Um, in this case, maybe 50 50 percent assembly or 50 maybe five hours assembly time and and three you know generously three hours of painting and decaling so that brings us to eight hours eight hours for 50 bucks it's pretty hard to engage in a hobby for less than that uh, on an hourly basis for enjoyment you know you go to the movies you know you're there for two hours uh, you spend 25 bucks just to get in, another 25 bucks for your popcorn and raisinets or whatever, and a drink, and and you're out of there in two hours, and probably, you know, by the next day you you've forgotten the popcorn and raisinets, and uh, you know the movie, you know maybe for a week or so, and you might bring it up every once in a while at a party. So, okay, so uh, that's it for today. Uh, thanks again for, to everyone for, for visiting the channel. Uh, thanks so much to my subscribers. I really do appreciate it. And I appreciate all the, all the positive comments and, and encouragement uh, that I, I'm, I'm receiving uh, from the community. You know, there's, there's always one or two uh, grumpy gussets out there. And I, I just try and, you know, let them go, whatever. Um, you know, if, if it turns your crank to insult me, well... Turn your crank. Uh, I've got a thick skin. It doesn't matter to me. Uh, I've made it perfectly clear. I do this for enjoyment and relaxation. I'm not in competition with anyone. And I wholeheartedly agree with my, uh, my friend Peter Roxley. Uh, who, who says, you know, this hobby isn't about uh, what other people think. Uh, it, it's, it's about what you think. It, it's about doing what you want to do and doing the best you can and hopefully uh, being pleased with the results and that's all that counts if you're pleased with the results it doesn't really matter what other people say and I also agree with Peter when he says that we're our own worst critics um, you know <laughs> you know you might build something up and you just kind of yeah it's okay whatever and then somebody comes over for dinner or whatever and they see it sitting on the shelf and they you know it's like, wow, that's amazing. It's great when that happens, but, you know, most of us don't do this for compliments. Okay, so uh, a bit longer than I expected, but I, I had a few topics to cover, including uh, ginger tea, which I need to sip up now because I've been talking for so long. So I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, if you don't want to visit the community channel to vote, uh, you can... Uh, leave a comment uh, as to uh, which uh, which kit you think I should build next. Uh, but I have to say, while I've been waiting for these votes to come in, I started Project X. Yes, Project X. Isn't that dramatic? And original. So, Project X is in the works. Uh, and... Uh, but it won't be revealed until after I do uh, the build that people have voted for. Okay, so that's it. And uh, happy modeling. I hope everybody has a great day. Happy and safe Halloween. And again, thanks so much for taking time to come see me on my channel. Have a great evening.